it's an enormous pleasure today to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Berkeley Space Center and Citrus, the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, and the Banato Institute for this extraordinary event uh, we're organizing today. My name is Alex Bayan, and as the Associate Provost for the Berkeley Space Center and um, the Director of Citrus, I'm really honored on behalf of both organizations to be able to host NASA astronaut Dr. Woody Hoburg today. This is the first event that Citrus is organizing with the Berkeley Space Center, and uh, we're really excited about this. Um, this is also, I believe, the first visit of uh, Woody since uh, he has returned from the International Space Station. Um, so we're really particularly excited to have him in this very building where he completed his PhD in electrical engineering and computer science um, a few years ago. Um, I think, as you can tell by the size of the audience today, uh, the level of enthusiasm today is really enormous and through the roof. I think this is the first time in 20 years since the existence of this building that we, it took one email and 10 minutes uh, to fill all the set and it put people on the wait list. So this is really, really exciting, um, which is also why we're broadcasting this event today uh, through our Citrus YouTube channel to a larger public, including uh, audiences at our partner campuses, Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz. So welcome to all. And it's also an opportunity for me uh, to salute our NASA viewers, both uh, here, um, and there's many of them, as well as online. Uh, the, the partnership with NASA and the Berkeley Space Center has just been fantastic, and, and really, uh, um, we couldn't be more blessed to be working on this uh, today. Um, I was originally going to invite uh, Professor Woody, uh, Professor uh, Peter Abil, Woody is also a professor, um, um, uh, Professor Peter Abil to the stage uh, to introduce uh, Woody since uh, Peter was the main um, PhD, was the PhD advisor of Woody when Woody was working in this building. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, Peter in the last minute had a, uh, something he had to go to, uh, so it'll be my job to do the introduction. I'm really excited. Um, so um, uh, let me introduce uh, NASA astronaut Dr. Woody Hoberg, uh, who uh, received a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautics and Astronautics at MIT in 2008, uh, subsequently uh, obtained a Master's uh, of science uh, at UC Berkeley in 2011 and a PhD in 2013 uh, in electrical engineering and uh, computer science uh, with Peter. Um, after completing uh, his doctorate, um, Woody worked uh, first at Boeing um, uh, for a little bit uh, and uh, uh, then uh, went on and became a professor at MIT. He was uh, selected uh, by NASA to join the 2017 astronaut uh, candidate class and reported for duty in August um, uh, 2017. Uh, he's also a pilot. He is an instrumented rated commercial pilot uh, in single engine and multi-engine airplanes. Uh, Woody launched in the International Space Station, this is really what we will hear about uh, today, um, as pilot of NASA SpaceX Crew, uh, Crew 6 mission aboard SpaceX uh, on Dragon Spacecraft in, on March 2nd, uh, 2033. Um, he came back on September 4th. Uh, we will also hear this as well. Um, Woody has stayed 186 days in space. Uh, it's also something that um, uh, you will hear about today. Um, there's one um, story I'd like to tell you about Woody, um, uh, which is uh, something that happened in this uh, very building. Um, so when uh, Woody was a student, um, the, actually this is what I call a charade moment. Um, charade refers to the movie uh, with Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn in, in which everybody's chasing the money, nobody knows where's the money, uh, lots of things happen, and at the end of the movie, one character in the middle of the stamp market um, in uh, Paris discover, oh, they had the money all along. It was in one of the stamps they were carrying with them. So they had it, they just didn't know it. That charade, a charade moment like this happened in this building on the seventh floor uh, where uh, Woody was working. One day, um, Woody came to my office, um, right around calls time, I believe, and um, he showed me a problem he was working on, uh, on optimization of a combination of aerodynamics coefficients that were essentially uh, optimizing some form of aircraft system. Now, these coefficients have a very specific shape. Uh, they are product of monomials, and then they are summed together. What that means is that uh, they are uh, simple, um, and then uh, multiplied together, they form something slightly more complex, and then added even more complex. Uh, for example, um, the uh, drag coefficient is proportional to the uh, mass of uh, the fluid and the square of the speed. And um, 
every aerospace engineer learns that um, in, in the introduction class. So all of us, including myself, have been watching these coefficients and reading these coefficients forever um, until Woody noticed that if you sum all of them together and writing in a specific form, they're actually something called polynomials. And if you're able to leverage that, you can actually prove, and that's what Woody did, that the resulting optimization program is a convex program, which is huge, because that means that first, you can solve it. And second, if you find a solution, this is the best. It might be multiple best, but this is the best. And this is something you learn at Berkeley in EE227, in optimization class. And all of the students and instructors, including myself, had also been looking at these polynomials and not realized that you could apply them to aerospace systems. So Woody, the charade moment is Woody brought these two together and essentially merged the two worlds. So there is really a pre-Woody and a post-Woody world in aerospace systems optimization, <laughs> and that's the charade moment. This happened in this, well, part of this happened in this very building between the seventh floor and the sixth floor. And that memory of, of your PhD, uh, Woody, is, is very dear to my heart. Um, so with this long introduction, um, I, here's what's going to happen. First, Woody is going to come and, and, and present the distinguished lectures. And then at the end of the presentation, our Dean of Engineering, uh, Professor Tsuji King Liu, who I think is somewhere, I just don't see where she is, um, will, uh, um, will come to the stage and moderate the uh, Q&A sessions. Uh, for the rest of the presentation. And at five, we'll have a nice reception for all of you to come and meet Woody if you want to. So with this, it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome NASA astronaut Dr. Woody Oberg to the stage. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today? Awesome. Thank you, Alex. That was an incredibly kind introdu introduction and brought back some really, really wonderful memories from here at Berkeley. All right, so I'm going to just show you uh, a few slides kind of telling my story of uh, my path from a little bit before my time at Berkeley through uh, getting assigned to my mission. And then I've got a video showing my time aboard the space station. And then we'll try to leave a, a bunch of time, I'm hoping, for some questions and interaction. OK, perfect. Um, so I'll start just a little bit, uh, just because it's, it's always fun to kind of, uh, we have so many diverse backgrounds as uh, astronauts, and so I'll just briefly tell my story of um, kind of early in life, what brought me uh, to NASA. So this is um, actually around high school age, I got really involved and interested in amateur rocketry and building these big rockets in my parents' garage, and this was kind of uh, the first thing that for me really got my hands dirty and got me excited about aerospace engineering, things that fly, uh, just introduced me to the world of trying to make uh, complicated aerospace systems work. I went off to college at MIT, studied aerospace engineering, and I was kind of a weird kid because I was uh, doing all my uh, college studies, but then every single weekend I was off in the mountains climbing in New Hampshire and then uh, later in Yosemite National Park doing these uh, big rock climbs. It was definitely my passion and interest outside of um, engineering. And that, that kind of, those parallel worlds played into um, a large part of my development. I'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, so I was uh, out of college looking at where to go to grad school. I, I was getting really interested in AI and robotics. And I learned about a young, uh, young new faculty member named Peter Abiel that was um, building these uh, systems that can fly an autonomous helicopter trained by a human pilot and do these really complicated air shows. So this was Peter's PhD. Um, I'm sure many here are uh, students of Peter Abiel. But I came here to Berkeley um, really excited to work with this guy doing cool intersection work between he uh, helicopters, which I love, and then uh, controls and AI. And uh, my path ultimately took me to uh, some of the work that Alex described a bit outside of uh, what Peter's lab was doing. But um, he was just a wonderful, wonderful advisor and uh, remains a great friend. I scoured my computer for pictures of me and Sutarja Dai Hall. And this was literally the only one I could find. <laughs> Alex tells me that this uh, workstation has been transformed into something different. But uh, there's me at my desk. I spent many, many hours there uh, laboring through my, uh, my PhD studies. I also looked for some compromising po photos of Peter. Um, and I apologize, this is extremely poor photo quality. But this, this is the pull-up bar we uh, perhaps illegally installed 
hanging from some of the infrastructure here in Sutar Jedi. I'm sure it's not up to code, uh, but that's Peter doing pull-ups along with uh, future Stanford professor John Ducci. <laughs> Um, during my time at Berkeley, I also, again, outside of my formal studies, I uh, was still really interested in climbing and I had an opportunity to work search and rescue in Yosemite National Park. And this was one moment where having a really, really wonderful PhD advisor turned out to be very important. Peter gave me the freedom to go to Yosemite during the summers and work search and rescue with this amazing group of people. Uh, responding to emergencies in Yosemite National Park. And during this time, I not only did the rescue work, but I also brought my research with me. I did a lot of studying in my downtime. I uh, spent many days in the SAR cache, hanging out, waiting for calls while doing my research. And it was actually one of the more academically productive periods of my studies at Berkeley. I did somehow manage to graduate eventually um, and uh, came out of uh, Berkeley just uh, really passionate about the, the types of work that Alex described, convex optimization in the context of engineering design. I was lucky enough to have an opportunity to go off to MIT, where I became a uh, young junior faculty member, started a research group, um, and we really started to dig in working on these ideas, bringing the powerful ideas of convex optimization to engineering design, which are two things that sort of, in my mind, surprisingly had not been put together, but fit together really well. So we worked on those mathematics. We wrote uh, a software package called GPKit that uh, allows engineers to write down these geometric programs and solve them. And then we worked on uh, aerospace applications so uh, like a lot of aircraft design. We actually had a student group um, that tackled the problem of designing an aircraft that can stay aloft for at least five days. And this was part of a uh, class project at MIT, but we used the software that came out of my research group and uh, we were able to design this drone. We, uh, that, that pickup truck in the photo is a, a later addition. The initial uh, test flights, we did uh, several test flights of this vehicle. The initial ones launched off of my car, which got very beat up in the process. Um, but this was just a wonderful experience taking our software, using it to solve a real problem, getting a bunch of students involved, building the airplane and flight testing it. And so it was right during uh, working, in all, working on all of this, about three years into being a young assistant professor at MIT, that um, I was lucky enough to get the call telling me I had been selected as one of the 2017 uh, NASA astronaut class. Um, this is an amazing group of people with just a wildly uh, diverse set of backgrounds. It's, it's really quite amazing. So just briefly, uh, going across the, the back row there, we have a Mars geologist, an Army helicopter pilot who's also a physician, an ocean engineer, Marine Corps helicopter test pilot, SpaceX engineer, a Navy SEAL who's also a physician, uh, myself, the token MIT professor in the group, um, <laughs> We have an Air Force test pilot, Navy test pilot, another, another Air Force test pilot, a uh, geobiologist, and a submar Navy submariner. So really diverse set of backgrounds and really, really fun to uh, just spend a lot of time with this group of people and go through our initial two years of training at NASA. Um, we train on all sorts of different things to get us ready and eligible for a flight assignment. Um, so this was a big shift for me, going from an academic research lab to just into the thick of kind of astronaut boot camp. Um, learned a lot about geology, which was something I had really knew nothing about. Did some uh, field trips out to New Mexico studying uh, geology. Uh, a lot of aviation training, ISS systems, uh, learned to fly the Canadian robotic arm, and then spent a lot of time in our pool, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab down in Houston, where we learn uh, spacewalking. And spacewalking is one of my favorite parts of the job and is one of those things where everybody comes in with their specialty and their, their unique background that maybe suited them uh, to being a good astronaut. Maybe they were a pilot or, or whatever it is in their background, but everybody that shows up, um, no one has been in a spacesuit and done a spacewalk. And so the, the spacewalk training is just really fun. Everybody's starting from scratch and you learn to operate in the suit and, um, and perform tasks. So we spend about six to seven hours underwater in the neutral buoyancy lab for each one of these training runs. 
Um, after boot camp, I worked some technical uh, job assignments. I was the increment lead for Expedition 64 aboard the ISS. I also worked on some of our exploration uh, work with going back to the moon. And as I was uh, doing those technical assignments, I got the uh, incredible phone call. Um, I think it was in uh, early 2021, so during the thick of COVID times, um, got the call that um, I was being assigned to be the pilot of Crew-6. So this is my crew, meaning the, uh, the group of four people that flew up on a SpaceX Dragon capsule with me up to the International Space Station. Um, on the far left in the photo is our Russian cosmonaut, Andrei Fedayev. We have Commander Steve Bowen. Um, he's a Navy submarine background. Myself as the pilot for the mission. And then uh, to my left in the photo, Sultan Al Nayadi, the first long duration um, astronaut from the UAE to, to fly a long duration mission aboard the space station. And in the back of this photo, uh, we are standing in front of the bottom of a Falcon 9 rocket full scale. So you see the, uh, the nine engines there and the landing legs. It is a very big machine when you see it in person. And we started about two years of training at that time, getting ready to go here, um, the International Space Station. So flying about 250 miles above Earth in low Earth orbit, doing uh, 17,500 miles an hour, about 90 minute orbits, 16 sunrises and 16 sets every, sunsets every day, and um, just living and working aboard this beautiful orbiting laboratory for, for six months. About two uh, years prior to launch, we started our training. Wide variety of mission specific tasks that we have to get ready for. This is some of the uh, water survival training that we do. So this is in case we land at an unsupported site uh, in the, we plan to land at a supported site in the Atlantic, but if we land on supported and have to get into our life raft, we do train for that. We do a fair amount of uh, what we call space flight readiness training. So it's aviation, flying uh, T-38 jets, and really getting, uh, this is really one of the best training platforms we have for just the type of operational thinking and uh, quick decision-making skills that we need for space flight. And then as I already mentioned, uh, my favorite training facility, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston, Texas. 40 feet deep, it's got a full-scale ISS underwater. We get into the suit, we operate under pressure, we get to feel what it, how the suit responds to us, and we get to practice maintenance tasks, including the specific maintenance tasks that I was expecting to perform during my mission. And then this is our mock-up of the inside of the space station, uh, also in Houston. It's a little less cluttered than the real space station, but it's a, it's a great mock-up for knowing where everything is, practicing emergency procedures, and some of the maintenance tasks that we might perform on the ISS. And then I spent about a quarter of my life out in Hawthorne, California, training with SpaceX, learning the Dragon vehicle, getting ready for those key phases of flight launch, re-entry, and uh, one port relocation we did. That brought us, after two years of that training, to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, ready to launch to space, which is pretty uh, amazing feeling to realize you've made it to that moment. And this is astronaut crew quarters where we suit up and get ready to ride out to our rocket. And here they come, Crew 6, taking their first steps outside before their journey to space. We get a, uh, it's about 20 minutes um, out to the pad and they actually let you pick your music that you listen to on the way out. There's also a tradition that you walk over to this special spot and try to look at your rocket in the, in the spacesuit, and it leads to that weird lean back. So we got all suited up and then something pretty unexpected happened. Hold, hold, hold. We're standing down to do a T-tap ground issue. So actually at least one person in the audience was there for this. We, uh, we had some issues with the fluid that ignites our engines. And with two minutes and 12 seconds to go, we had to scrub our launch and we actually offloaded all the fuel off the vehicle and we did not go to space. And then three, three days later, we did literally the same thing all over again. Exactly the same thing. <laughs>
So it turned out that that scrub was actually a great practice run for the real event. And the commander and pilot, Stephen and Woody, our mission specialist, Sultan and Andre, with a big thumbs up, getting ready to board Dragon. It's funny how it just goes a little smoother the second time around. So I thought I would be nervous, but I was actually uh, just locked in following our procedures. It's about one and a half G's off the pad. We're very heavy. And then as we burn fuel, we get we get up to about four and a half G's during stage one as the rocket gets lighter. And then second stage is a single Merlin vacuum engine. Again, it gets to about four and a half G's. You see the gap there between there stage one and two. Screen. Confirmation. Dragon separation confirmed. And 12 minutes in, we're in low Earth orbit. Took about 24 hours to phase up to the space station. And then we got this incredible view um, through our thermal cameras of the place we've been training for for so long. We docked to no two Zenith. Steve Bowen on board the International Space Station. And you're pretty clumsy Woody at Hoberg first. Now on board. Sultan so you notice the uh, the experienced crew there the helping us. But it only takes a few days, and you get used to floating and uh, slowly get used to living and working in weightlessness. We hit the ground running. This cargo vehicle called SpaceX 27 came up full of all sorts of, ex of science experiments. These uh, SpaceX cargo vehicles can actually return live uh, science experiments and payloads back to Earth. So it's a very busy time. We grew some plants uh, in space, grew some tomatoes. Uh, this is Steve working on the Japanese airlock where we can actually send uh, payloads out into the vacuum of space through an airlock. So he's working on some so small satellite deployers. There we go. We have actually three of these Melfi freezers that we use to store samples at minus 80 degrees for long-term term, uh, cold storage. And anytime we have cargo vehicles coming and going, we're always transferring samples around. Cardinal Heart was a really cool experiment and led to one of the coolest days on Space Station where Sultan actually uh, saw some heart muscle tissue beating. So this is Sultan getting ready to look at our work through the microscope. That was a pretty wild day, realizing we were literally working on beating heart cells in space. It's really varied. Um, every day, you're working on something different. Um, I got a fair amount of training on each of these different um, experiments on the ground, but really we're just operators where the experts are on the ground. This is also, uh, we printed a section of human meniscus. So this is some uh, biofabrication work. Um, and then we'll put that multi-white into the trash bag. Printing structures that can only be constructed in a weightless environment. It would not work to try to do that on Earth. And I believe this is Steve playing with my blood. <laughs> I did not know that I would have to learn to draw my own blood, but that was one of the skills I learned prior to flying to space. I'm pretty good at it now. And we're also doing a lot of work studying combustion in space. Without uh, buoyancy, uh, things burn differently. 
And then these Astro B robots, I got to uh, run some student programming competitions where students write code to uh, run aboard these Astro B robots. And those were some fun days as well. So during my expedition, uh, we did a total of three spacewalks. I went outside for two of them. And for the first one, I had the honor of being the uh, suit IV, so the person in charge of suiting up our crew to go outside. So this first one was uh, Steve and Sultan. Copy. You are now go to egress the airlock. And they Hold went on. out to... You're making history today. Congratulations. We're so excited for you. Hope you both have a great EVA, and we'll see you in just a few hours. So Sultan performed the first Arab spacewalk ever, Bravo one, and he created a huge amount of excitement and uh, enthusiasm in his region. It was just really awesome getting to watch him do this. These guys were actually able to set up um, some mounting kits for the solar arrays that I would just install on my spacewalks. So my spacewalks were installing two new ISS rollout solar arrays, and I got to ride in the uh, end of the Canadian robotic arm. This is releasing the uh, solar arrays. You see the rolls there from their mounting bracket. And then we have there, our video I'm... back. Everything is looking great. I have two cautions for you, Woody. That's me carrying the solar array and uh, it rolling out. All the best uh, for uh, this uh, EVA. I'm sure you're going to crush it just like last time. Wish you all the best. We'll be here for support and uh, make us a call. These add about 30 kilowatts each to uh, each of the power channels that they're upgrading. These spacewalk days are a big oh, day in mission control as well. Uh, and a half minutes. Sounds great, I'm ready. And so Sultan and Frank are driving the robotic arm with me in the end carrying these solar arrays. This is the uh, commute out to the work site. And he's been following we're okay with going to golf. Okay, going to golf. And every 45 minutes, it switches from day to night. So that was that was really rewarding getting to do those spacewalks. Um, we'll also just show kind of some of what life aboard the ISS is. We had a great crew. Um, a total crew of seven is kind of the long-term crew sometimes more during a few uh, handovers, and we had one private mission come up and visit us. But this group of seven was the, the long-term uh, inhabitants for my six-month stay. This is uh, node one where we eat. Steve uh, preparing the spacesuits, Sultan in the cupola. That's one of the Dragon cargo vehicles. We do a lot of exercise. This is Sultan running on our treadmill, bungeed down to the surface. And it's actually on the wall, so he's running facing the floor. <laughs> and I think I'm getting ready for uh, some EVAs here. We played a lot of chess with Mission Control. That was fun. Did about one move a day back and forth. we hear you loud and clear. How do you hear us? I hear you just great. We are a sea station. I got you loud and clear. Welcome, sir. And then we also just share what we're doing with the world. So we do these uh, PR events. Whoa! We we did Space Olympics one Sunday. <laughs> Tried to invent as many games as we could. And the food is actually fantastic. We we managed to make some pizzas. <laughs> and it's hard not to be friends when you're uh, stuck together for six months and, and having an amazing life experience. And then uh, toward the end of our mission, Crew 7 came up. This is Crew 7 arriving, and these are our replacements. I also just want to sh briefly show some of the uh, Earth observations we do. I took uh, 
on the order of 10,000 photos during my mission. The aurora at high latitudes are just amazing. You get to see the atmosphere. It pretty much never gets old going to the window and just enjoying time in the cupola, whether it's taking photos or just kind of taking it all in. I think Sultan was our best photographer but I also tried to uh, capture a lot of images. And you realize how thin the atmosphere is, of course. We have an international disaster charter program where if there's a big wildfire or a hurricane or other natural disaster, we actually get a message aboard the space station and we try to get images of it right away. Try to get those down to first responders. These are uh, wildfires up in Canada. We were up there for the big fires in Hawaii, which is a really tragic. We did get some photos of that. You can see the uh, occasional lightning strikes. Watching lightning storms from space really never gets old. Uh, so we did, that was a six month mission and then it was time to come home. This was early September. Dragon. Confirmation from our crew members aboard Endeavor. The Dragon hatch itself is closed, that coming at 4.19 a.m. Central Time. You know, you see our Draco thrusters firing as we undock at night here. The flight home is really one of the more Dragon dynamic SpaceX parts of the mission. On the big loop, depart burn one is complete and nominal. We're going 17,500 miles an hour. We have a lot of energy in the system and we have to uh, take it all out. So re-entry loads are similar to launch loads. About four and a half Gs is the peak uh, deceleration. And this was a cool video. We managed to combine some videos that people took from the ground of us being a meteor with uh, what we saw from inside the vehicle. What your Dragon, SpaceX, comm check. Several minutes of radio blackout because of the plasma. And then we get drogue shoots. Drogue pyros have fired and we have good confirmation of drogue shoots. 5.7 kilometers is the altitude where we release the drogues there. That's our view <laughs> up into the parachute bay. And then we release mains. And release the four parachutes, now deploying. At this point in time, Dragon has saved all of its propulsion systems and is now uh, has already terminated that nitrox suit and cabin purges. Because we're helping to keep the... That's the disreefing on the mains, the so gradual deceleration. You definitely Four feel that from within the capsule. Parachutes. And I really like the, the hot and cold you see in the thermal camera. The capsule's hot and the parachutes are cold. On screen. Those parachutes are then cut and released. And this whole sequence of events is very physical. You really feel this uh, after being deconditioned for six months. We actually landed in some of the highest sea states that Dragon has ever landed in, at least a crewed Dragon. So we were able to kind of push the envelope a little bit on our uh, sea state landing capability. And 
time. So we get lifted onto the recovery ship in the capsule and then we get extracted out uh, by an amazing team of flight surgeons and recovery personnel. And then they actually got some science from us right away before we even flew to Houston and then uh, we fly back to Houston. And you'll see we're all trying not to move our heads because of the uh, impacts on our vestibular system. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I think we'll move to Q&A now. And what I would like to do is I'm going to, in the background, just put up, I have some uh, just nice earth imagery that we collected during my mission. So that'll just be playing in the background. So I have the honor as Dean of the College of Engineering to moderate this Q&A session. And I think we have a lot of students here who are ready to ask questions, but maybe I'll start with the first one. You know, you shared with us a little bit about your experience here as a student. Um, what here? What part of your experience here as a student really helped to prepare you for the amazing adventure and you know your career to, to date? Well, two things. The first one is easy. It's the people. I was lucky uh, to have an absolutely amazing PhD advisor, and then also just amazing fellow graduate students. And I have so many fond memories from just you know, the, the good times, but also the bad times and just kind of uh, late night whiteboard sessions and just that shared experience with uh, my fellow students. I, I remember that very fondly. Um, and then number two, I came from an aerospace engineering undergrad uh, program and I came here to Berkeley to study computer science. And that was an intentional choice on my part, but I think to the question of what helped prepare me, I feel so lucky <laughs> Uh, that I had the opportunity to work at the intersection of two fields. I think it allowed me to um, have little insights from, from both fields. And honestly, it just made my life a lot easier because I was able to just notice things from one field or the other that were maybe not so obvious except being in that intersection. And I really appreciated uh, during my time here at Berkeley seeing uh, how many people had that willingness and even desire to work at intersections. Fantastic, and, and learn new things. I mean, clearly when you prepared for the mission and even on the mission, you had to learn a lot of new skills, a lot of new knowledge. That's really amazing. Okay, why don't we see what students would like to ask you. Yeah, please uh, just say your name, your major, and ask your question. Uh, I think now it's on, sweet. Um, hey, Woody, my name is Rhea. I'm a mechanical engineering major. I'm actually also a NASA co-op at JSC. Um, so I got to work part of your mission, which is super dope. But what I'm curious about is you started off your career pretty deep into academia. You were doing a PhD, you were a professor. Um, and I know being an astronaut is a very operational role. So what made you want to make that leap into doing more operational tasks? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, that sure is true. Um, I, I always, to be very honest with you, I always felt a little bit lost. Um, and specifically what I mean by that is I had a very technical part of myself. Like I was good at math. I was excited about solving engineering problems. I loved my research as a graduate student. Um, I knew I wanted to keep pursuing that part of me. I also had, uh, as you called it, a sort of operational side of myself. I was really into rock climbing. I uh, was flying airplanes. I got into search and rescue. I wanted to be out like responding to emergencies. Uh, and these two sides of me, uh, I felt pretty passionate about both of them. And I also found it difficult to merge those two sides of myself. I was sort of searching for opportunities that would allow me to merge them. And um, I think I, I mean, the astronaut role is sort of the perfect merging of those two worlds. I think even before NASA, I found that I was able to merge those more and more. So like as a young faculty member, um, my group, I made very intentional decisions to not just, we were doing fairly theoretical work actually, 
But uh, I was very intentional wanting to see that applied to systems in the real world. I wanted to build an airplane. And so I, and I wanted to flight test an airplane. And so that, um, that felt like a bit of a leap. It was uh, maybe not as easy as just doing the theoretical work, but I very much wanted to uh, kind of continue uh, pushing forward that operational side of myself. Uh, here uh, first of all, it's a real pleasure to meet you. I've been a fan for years. Uh, my name is Mohammed Bukhari. I'm, um, I'm doing also aerospace here at Berkeley. Uh, my question is, what are the core skills that you thought were most important to become an astronaut? Uh, for example, like getting a pilot training and some of that stuff. Great to meet you. And by the way, it's so cool that you can say, I'm studying aerospace engineering here at Berkeley. That's awesome. <laughs> Go Berkeley. <laughs> um, I'm going to answer uh, fairly generally and broadly, and that's very intentional because, as I mentioned, uh, the set of backgrounds that work out as potential astronaut candidates um, is very broad. So there's just no right answer. For example, flying, you could become a pilot. You could not become a pilot. It doesn't matter. Um, so I'm not going to be super specific. Broadly, I think there are three sort of three core types of skills that are extremely important that really everyone working in human spaceflight uh, possesses. I don't even think it's limited to the astronaut core. It really is human spaceflight. Um, number one is just technical competency in something. Number two is operational competency. And what I mean by that is when you get thrown into a situation where things are happening in unexpected ways and it's a bit chaotic, can you handle it and arrange the chaos and kind of move forward? Um, and then number three is teamwork, being a good team player, getting along well with others. Sounds like a graduate program here with prepare you well. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Eric. I'm a third year nuclear engineering major. So I was wondering if there's anything in like the aerospace in industry or space industry in general that like is happening in the near future that you're really looking forward to or excited about. I want us to have a moon base. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I mean, th this is, uh, I really think, the most ex exciting time in space in uh, many decades. We uh, already, just looking at low Earth orbit, it's wildly exciting what's happening. We are seeing, you know, I was the beneficiary of the commercial crew program and the success that SpaceX has had. Um, when I joined the astronaut corps, we did not have the capability to fly NASA astronauts from the United States to the space station. It was 2017 and we did not possess that capability. In 2020, we launched Bob and Doug aboard Demo 2 uh, which was the first uh, human launch out of Florida since the shuttle retired in 2011. And we are now doing regular crew rotation flights out of Florida. Um, and not only that, that's the human part. SpaceX launched almost 100 flights to low Earth orbit last year. So every three or four days, there is a rocket launching to low Earth orbit, which is mind boggling. Um, there's a ton of activity happening in low Earth orbit. And then, that's already pretty exciting, on top of that, with Artemis, we're going to the moon. Um, the Artemis II crew has been named. They are launching in September of 2025. They're gonna go fly out around the moon. They're gonna test out skip re-entry, which is really uh, exciting. Um, and they're gonna put the Orion vehicle through its paces. And then the next flight after that is landing on the moon. And so yeah, to, and then to come full circle, I want us to set up a sustained presence on the moon and have moon bases and moon rovers and nuclear power on the moon, and all sorts of exciting things. <laughs> Hi, my name is Miles Rulier. I'm an electrical engineering and computer science major. And reflecting on your journey to becoming an astronaut, and most importantly, experience what it's like to be outer space, what like pieces of wisdom and like key lessons would you tell someone who also wants to become an astronaut? Awesome, great question. And I know it's a question that many, many people have, so I appreciate you asking it. 
Um, I also knew in the back of my mind that I wanted to be an astronaut and that desire sort of fluctuated, I recall, throughout my uh, development and career. Um, and it's so easy to look back in hindsight, I guess, um, and I know it's harder to, to live it. <laughs> but my advice is simple. It is to shorten your time horizon. And what I mean by that is that there are so many different pathways to achieve this big goal that's way off in the future. I think the most important thing is to right now, with the immediate decisions you have right now, choose to work on things that you're passionate about and excited about and that you're gonna be happy having worked on that no matter what happens. So I am grateful that you know, I was working on things where honestly, by the time I got selected, I was sad to leave. I was mostly sure that I was gonna take the job, but part of me said, should I really take this job? Because I'm loving what I'm doing right now. So um, just shorten that time horizon. Don't worry about the far out future. Worry about right now and do things you are, they don't have to be things that are easy or uh, they could be hard and you know really horrible experiences, <laughs> but do things that you think are important and that uh, bring you some sort of fulfillment now. Hi, uh, my name is David Northrup Gooder. Thanks for coming. i um, studying bioengineering here. Um, my question to you is you kind of mentioned SpaceX, and I'm really curious how you see the role of private companies and privatized space ventures um, moving forward into the future, if you think there's anything we should be aware of, or maybe even areas that should have more focus from the private sector. Hmm. Well, broadly, um, I think we've seen the commercial crew program has been an enormous success. And you know, before that, that's uh, that's the human spaceflight part of it. And before that, you know, back in the mid 2000s, NASA needed a way to fly cargo up to the space station, and uh, you know, SpaceX won a contract to to pr provide exactly that service, and that really got that company off the ground. And it's been an enormous success, obviously. Um, so I think in low Earth orbit, we're going to just see more and more of that model which is NASA would love to be a cus one of many customers for um, services uh, flying both cargo and people to low Earth orbit. And I think we're just going to see more and more of that. Um, and that's very intentional because, you know, big picture, NASA has a limited budget and we've had great success aboard the ISS and we're going to continue operating there. But Big picture and long term, we really want to go set up shop on the moon, and it is NASA's role to push that exploration forward. So we really want to move beyond low Earth orbit. And so I think you're just going to see more and more commercial activity in low Earth orbit. And from the NASA perspective, that is a great thing. We want as much as we can have. Um, I'm Ashanti, bioengineering, and I just wanted to ask, um, seeing that you were uh, astronaut, professor, and all of these rock climber, um, what do you see yourself doing in the future? Do you want to go to the moon? <laughs> I would go to the moon if I had the opportunity. I even, I'm so excited about the moon that just getting to work on our return to the moon, even if I'm not the one going, sounds pretty great to me. Um, so yeah, near term, that is, you know, to live the advice I just gave, thinking short term, I am pretty excited about us going back to the moon and I wanna make that happen. Hi, um, my name is Galler. I'm an electrical engineering computer science student here at Berkeley. Um, I also wanna be an astronaut. Um, just curious, like there's so many possibilities for what to focus on in your undergrad. I was wondering if there's anything particular that you did or any mindsets you employed that helped get to where you are today to become an astronaut. Yeah, I would again go back to the, if there's something you're passionate about that you find fulfilling and get enjoyment out of, I just encourage you to go do it. I mean, in my example, um, I was leaving school to go rock climbing, which is, I mean, did not feel like it was well aligned with getting an engineering degree or becoming a professor or any of these things. And honestly, I'm not sure that it even helped me become an astronaut, but it was just something I wanted to do. And I think it probably helped me in ways that even I don't understand, but I'm glad I did it. I'm glad that I pursued that sort of outside passion. So I really encourage uh, if you have those things that um, 
add sort of um, enrich your life one way or another, go do them. And then academically, um, I was in an aerospace major, but I was at the time really interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence and like machine vision. And um, I was writing a lot of software. Um, so I was kind of strange from that perspective uh, as somebody in an aerospace department, but those were things I was interested in. And from an academic perspective, I'm so glad that I was uh, willing to jump across fields a bit. I think my return on investment there has been enormous um, by being able to straddle two fields. Uh, if you have any interests like that, I encourage you to go ahead and pursue them. Hi, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I'm Sophia, I'm a mechanical engineering student. And prior to your uh, astronaut boot camp, I'm wondering um, what kind of physical capabilities did you have to have and skills um, to be able to like be well suited to go into space? Yeah, a lot of people are actually, sorry, Sagan. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Um, a lot of people are surprised. There's no, um, to my knowledge, maybe it's uh, something that we're just not told about, but I couldn't quote you numbers, like you have to be able to lift this much or run this fast or, or anything like that. You do have to be in good shape and it's all um, just in the name of uh, staying in shape on orbit. Um, as you're probably aware in weightlessness, uh, we have big issues with losing bone density and muscle mass. Um, among other things. And so we do a pretty uh, significant physical training regimen aboard the space station. Um, it's about an hour, hour of cardio a day. That's between a bike and a treadmill. And then the other hour and a half is lifting, like resistance exercise, squats, deadlift, bench press, rows. And um, I actually came back, for example, stronger in bench press than when I launched. And I got a weird little fat pad on my back from squatting because I literally squatted every day for 186 days. Every single day I was doing squats. And so, um, yeah, the, the training prior to that is um, we just really, it, it's uh, fairly open-ended, but it is stay in shape. Yeah. I have to ask before the next question. Did you, how much did you sleep? Yeah. Um, so sleep aboard the space station. We operate on Greenwich Mean Time. We do a 24-hour day. So you just get up at, I was getting up at like 6.30 every morning, Greenwich Mean Time. Um, in, during our 24-hour day, we have 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets. Um, but at night, I ha we have crew quarters we can go in. It gets dark. Um, we can actually shut the lights off in the space station. So you get a nice dark place to sleep. And I slept a solid eight hours. Um, you sleep floating, kind of bungeed to the wall. It's a little bit weird at first, but you get used to it. Hi, I'm Paul. I'm also studying aerospace engineering. It's such an honor to meet you. Um, I was just wondering with Crew Dragon um, being such a modern platform, how much of the flight is controlled autonomously versus by the crew or mission control? Yeah. Uh, great question. So in the nominal mission, it is, um, well, we are, it's, it's basically 100% autonomous. Um, in the nominal mission. There are a few key, um, basically, state transitions where we actually choose, and this is kind of the crew preference. Uh, we like sending the command, for example, to initiate the docking sequence. There's a command, we just send that command, and we like the vehicle pausing there and us making sure that we're all on the same page before we proceed with that part of the plan. But it's, it's literally just sending a command to start the state machine um, doing its autonomous docking. Um, we do have the capability to uh, fly the vehicle. We train for that, um, but it's not part of the nominal con, con ops. Um, on my mission, things actually got interesting. We had a hook failure on hook number five. Uh, it was actually not the hook that was failed, but one of the micro switches that uh, senses the state of the hook. And these are the hooks that we use for hard capture to the space station. Um, we knew this to be the case shortly after orbital insertion. Uh, so this is 
20 or so hours before our docking. And um, a software fix was uploaded. Mission Control uploaded a software fix um, to basically mask that switch and allow us to, to dock. So we uh, proceeded in for docking and at uh, waypoint two, which is 20 meters from docking, really close, um, we actually alarmed out of the docking sequence. So alarms ringing in the cabin and the state machine was unable to transition to basically the final uh, approach segment. And that had to do with really subtle, unexpected behavior in the software that uh, wasn't tested. So um, that involved mission control work, uh, like mission control Hawthorne, SpaceX, um, being thinking on their feet and uploading a fix to uh, you know understand what had happened and then uh, fix the software and allow us to dock. Um, so anyway, it's a, it's a mix, I guess, to, to fully answer your question. But it is, to your point, a highly automated vehicle. I think we only have time for one more question. And Sarah, I think you had someone. No, sorry, time, time is a limited capacity. Uh, hi, I'm Kale. I'm in bioengineering. Um, super lighthearted question. Uh, what song or songs did you listen to on the 20 minute drive to the launch pad? On the way out? Yeah. On the way out to the launch pad? Um, Let's see, we, we each got to pick a few. I, I, I'll, I'll give you two of them. One uh, was a CCR song in, in honor of my late father who unfortunately passed away shortly before my launch, but my dad loved CCR. So there was a CCR song on my playlist. And then... Um, they, might not be too, you know, they might be too young. Creedence, Creedence Clearwater, Clearwater Revival. Revival. can look them up, they're a cool band. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> know your audience. Um, <laughs> And then uh, because I was flying uh, with Steve Bowen and we both had uh, Boston ties, we elected uh, for the final drive up to our rocket, we listened to uh, a Dropkick Murphys song called I'm Shipping Up to Boston. <laughs> Wait, can I ask one last question? Um, like if, since most of us are Berkeley engineers here, what are there, are there any remaining technological challenges that we can help solve to realize your vision of people living on the moon? The moon, um, we're gonna do a lot on the moon, but and uh, big picture, we're using the moon as a proving ground to get to Mars. And I think we have some real technological challenges to get to Mars. A big one is definitely radiation. Um, and I think we will use the moon as a place to prove out some of the technologies that we'll need to get to Mars. Another is uh, we will likely need uh, some form of either in-space refueling or in-situ resource utilization um, to get further into the, the solar system. And so uh, being able to do that, like experiment with those technologies in a place where if it doesn't work, we can still come home safely is a really important part of the overall architecture and um, getting to Mars ultimately. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again, Woody, for joining us. We really are proud of you and we wish you continued success and hopefully you've inspired many of our future um, engineers and astronauts to follow your footsteps. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's an honor to be back at Berkeley. And uh, I'm super excited about all the new, you know, the new aerospace major and the new Berkeley Space Center. Uh, what you're doing is super exciting. And it's just great to be back on campus. Well, welcome back. And you're always welcome. Go back. Thank you, thank you so much. So on behalf of the Berkeley Space Center and Citrus, it's been a really fantastic day. Thank you so much, Woody, for coming today. Um, I'm gonna um, take this opportunity to thank you for taking us on your journey. Um, you really made it feel like home, like, uh, like being there with you. Um, so for the rest of the events, what we're gonna do now is uh, we're gonna have a reception outside. Everybody is welcome uh, to come. I'm sure many of you want a picture with Woody. Uh, so we have a selfie line organized at the museum. <laughs> We're very organized here. So if you want your picture taken with Woody, just go to the museum. There's a line, we'll let you in and the picture will be taken. And then at the end, uh, uh, Woody will join us for the reception and you can meet Woody. Once more time, thank you so much for coming today. <laughs> <laughs>